Welcome to Turn Right Machine Works. My name is Keith. And today we're going to do just a little bit of this and a little of that. Um, just more or less uh, kind of a sh show around. And I also have a couple questions that have been asked on the, uh, on the plasma cutter and my setup and stuff. So I'm going to kind of get into that as well. Before we go into there or uh, talk about what we got going on in the shop here and what's been holding us off of our main project that we've been dying to get back onto. I uh, picked up a box here and uh, says, Dear Keith, let me uh, begin by telling you how sorry I am to hear about your father's passing. Thank you very much for everybody that's uh, uh, given me condolences for my dad there. It's never easy to lose an parent or any other member of the family. That's, you know, I, thank you very much. Please accept the contents of this box as a kind thank you for your videos. Although I have watched a few of these, I have not yet subscribed. I'm not quite sure how um, I'm a computer dummy and I and will all start out there. I didn't learn computers until 2000 and, uh, and then I've just self-taught myself from there. You're in the trenches every day and I appreciate what you do. Although I have a pretty well outfitted 1970 South Bend Heavy 10 machine in my shop, these tools would probably be a bit much for it. I can actually envision a sign flashing. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and a hand uh, coming out and giving me a slap, if ever, if I even tried. Hopefully you can use them or know somebody you can. I guess they would be good candidates as sacrifice tooling for the job. The arbors and extras I had laid out, uh, around. I don't have a lot of background in machining and watch you work through projects helping with insight and confidence when faced with particular problems I may encounter in my shop. What little experience in machining knowledge has been passed on to me by my mentor in the rod business. He was a 60 year old tool maker and worked for places like Winchester High Standard Machine Gun Division World War II and Pratt and Whitney. He's, uh, he's been gone now for 12 years. May he rest in peace. I have a few years on you but never too late to learn. Problem is I soon forget what I've seen. <laughs> um, Dana Gray. Thank you uh, Dana and uh, let's go ahead and I pulled one of these out and he's got them wrapped up and these are individual tools and this is uh, uh, a nice uh, right hand turning tool and uh, Super Morris g and w and I'm just going to see if I can pull out this whole piece right here and set it on the table here. I'm not going to open and go through this whole thing here, but I'm going to, I just want to uh, show you that I am opening it and made it here safe. Everything was individually wrapped. These are probably some offset uh, straight in notching or groove cutting. Yes, very nice. Actually, I like these uh, and I like to actually radius these uh, for coming in on the root of a thread where you got a thread relief behind the thread and you give it a little bit of a radius. It's real nice to uh, shape that out. All right, I'll open these up and uh, and I'll kind of uh, go through these. I thank you very much again, Dana. Um, another mailing that came in, and of course this was a box. Um, Nick sent me this box, <clears throat> and it was 23 pounds of 532 brazing rod, made in the United States. Excellent uh, gift. I thank you very much. All right, now let's uh, let's go ahead and we're going to take a look around a couple of the things that are going on in the shop that actually <laughs> keep me busy. And sometimes you get those ones that slip in the door and they got to be turned around. So your long-term jobs, you got to stick to the side a little bit and knock them out and then get back to your project. All right, so here's how it looks. seems like every time I turn around and I want to work on my uh, new rudder project that I got going on, something else comes in the door. Uh, this is a, one of the big boats down in Hyannis Marine and uh, they lost a louver and 
the, the boy down there made me up a new Uber to put in here and they just wanted me to go ahead and wall it in place. So we've kind of done that. I don't know if this is powder coating or it's just some uh, really high-tech coat paint. It was pretty rough getting it off and getting it clean, but uh, you know, about two to three welds right here. And uh, we'll be back onto our rotor project, which we're really looking forward to. in here left-handed something like that so you get the right torch angle and all that so you just gotta you gotta <clears throat> keep in practice for a project next week.
We had another drill press uh, spindle sent to us, and this was sent by Bill Schirrer, I believe is the pronunciation on his name. It says, Dear Keith, thanks for agreeing to take this little spindle project. In close, you will find the spindle from my 1940s air Delta drill press. I have coated it in, uh, always coated it and wrapped it in plastic, prevented the oxidization. Uh, uh, he left a bluing and, uh, from his test fit on here and uh and poor fit the taper seems to be not aligned with the major axis of the spindle as as discussed in the email uh looking forward to seeing the repairs all right bill uh, <clears throat> what i found on on your shaft is there's absolutely nothing wrong with your shaft uh, i've checked it with run out all the way now, i put a block here so i could hold it in one direction there and even verify that there is no run out at all on the taper as you take a look at the taper, you can see the contact up in here and a couple little lines in there show me that it is making contact there. And uh, also down below where the main rub is, I can see that there's contact there. So basically, and, and I can go like this with my finger and I, and I don't feel any groove or anything else in that area. So I, I say this taper is really good shape. This one ring right here is something in your bore and you, you look down in your bore, whether it be a raised metal or a chip, um, galled area, uh, you should be able to see the Sharpie rubbed off onto that little spot that's in the bore. And that is enough to create a misalignment on your chuck. Uh, so it looks like somebody might have lost grip on the chuck and then slammed it back together with maybe something in there, uh, not clean or... It has spun on there for some reason. It didn't take any material off of here, but it created its own. Or it was off of another spindle that had spun, and then somebody stuck it on this uh, spindle here. Now, I believe your problem is in the chuck itself. Uh, there's, I can't find anything wrong with the shaft. And this is still a good condition right here, and if you got that removed and you wanted to, you could relap your chuck onto this and create a suitable fit, or go ahead and buy a new chuck. Now this taper here, we looked in the book here, and it's dimensions, uh, it's a number 33 Jacobs chuck. And so that'll be what you'll, you'll be shopping for if you choose to go with a new chuck. All right, uh, just a quick note on, uh, on your project here, and I'm going to get it in a box and ship it back to you. All right, thanks for the project, Bill. All right, we're doing good. <clears throat> this was uh, an input shaft for a transmission, and... Uh, the gentleman brought it in, wanted this diameter turned down to fit a diameter. He was swapping this flange out, and of course uh, there's a lot of change outs being done uh, here and there because people, uh, you know, building uh, used equipment. Anyhow, I went in, I polished this area back here so that, uh, you know, I was able to grab it my three jaw, but I wanted to make sure that I was running true to take this diameter because this was going to register it. So. I went ahead and I cleaned this area right back here and that's where I was putting my indicator and I had to uh, rotate it a couple times and uh, and then confirm it with this register out here uh, that I was running true so I mean a lot of times you'll see that I use a three jaw to grab a hold of something but this is a pretty big object here and uh, with a little man manipulation around and uh, using my rawhide hammer I'm able to get this thing to run true enough to, to cut this as a register for this uh, input shaft. This does not spin, it, it, but it does need to locate in a straight line. Um, anyway, small job done. Now we're taking it out. I wanted to throw another share at you that I uh, had sitting on my desk and misplaced it between starting this uh, little video clips cruising around the shop. And I had a gentleman come in the back door of the shop the other day and, and he popped in and says, I really like your videos, <clears throat> especially uh, there's a lesson in here somewhere video and unfinished tooling. And, uh, and I said, well, thank you very much. And, he's, and then from behind his back, he pulls out, of course, it's a birdhouse. You can see that right off the bat. And uh, so he hands it to me and I, I'm looking at it. And I have one almost exactly like this down at the garden. I, I really like it a lot. Uh, you can open it up and clean it out when you know the birds are done nesting and stuff. It's got uh, ventilation up, up down below and above. It's got an angle here that sheds the water. 
and uh, he's got a nice mounting post and he's even drilled two clearance holes to go ahead and um, mount it up to the fence post that I like to use it on. Um, he says, now there's, there's a couple important things about this. And I said, oh, what's that? He says, this was made by a U.S. Uh, citizen. Said it was made with materials from the United States. And the machines that it made this go together, meaning the equipment he used to make this, were all made here in America. And so he, uh, he came and he gave me this for the thank you for posting those videos there that he enjoyed very much. And <clears throat> I want to say that he's even stamped it on the back here and handcrafted by Scott Cleves. Uh, he's a shop teacher over at DY. And uh, anyway, it's, uh, I wanted to share that with you because uh, it, it's just, you know, somebody coming in and saying thank you and, and, uh, and giving a little bit of a meaning to um, keep on trucking on making my videos and I appreciate that very much. Alright, let's take a little intermission from our regular uh, feature program here and we're over here at the plasma cam and I get asked um, can you do a video of that one inch cutting and I'm going to try to do that and give you a, a nice video presentation of, of the plasma cam cutting this one inch. And, uh, and then we're going to get back and we're going to be uh, cutting some one-eighth on our uh, regular program here. But for right now, um, I'm set up on this one-inch plate and we're going to go ahead I'm going to go over and I'm going to turn on the plasma cam. I'll take you over there because I get asked uh, what machine am I actually using and what torch uh, and a couple of those things. So let's hit those highlights real quick here while we're taking a break. Alright, this is, this is my plasma uh, power source here. And you can see here I'm using the thermodynamics to Cutmaster 81. Um, I used to have a Cutmaster 80 XL, I think it was called, and it was high freak start. And I had to upgrade to this machine here before I could actually plan on running it in combination with the plasma cam because of the high freak start. You want to make sure that you're complacent with your your uh, machine as well as your uh, your table and your software as well. All right, now on the front. Now uh, you can see here it's pretty simple, it's just 20 to 60 amp control right here. So if I'm running or switching and running smaller torches or uh, nozzles and, and the consumables for the 20 amps, I can set this dial down and, and be very comfortable. And right now I'm running in the 60 amp, I'm running this thing just a little bit backed up from wide open. Alright, and then your regular on and off. And then you can have intermittent cut, like if you're doing expanded metals and things like that, test for your air. Okay. Now a lot of people ask me uh, what am I running. The regulator is always set and I'm running at 75 PSI's on my air almost all the time. As far as right now the only thing I have for drying my air is a desiccant dryer and this is a Wilkerson and this really does work out pretty good and uh, I've just changed out my desiccant in here and it's just starting to turn pink down here but you know in, a, in about a month or so I'll go through this right here I don't really have a big problem with dry air I do have a refrigerator dryer that I want to add onto this machine and stuff I just haven't had chance to get it and I have another one of these chambers to go ahead and double up my desiccant as well so that I can go longer without having to uh, change or, or recure my desiccant materials. But for right now that's what I'm using for a dryer to dry my air going into my cut. And I think it is very very important and I do notice a slight bit of difference when this thing really starts getting pink all the way up here and there's only a little bit of blue left. I do notice a difference in my cut and my consumables lasting. Now the torch that I am using is an SL60 and it's the regular grip style and I got it slipped into my holder right here and that's I I am manufacturing these holders right now we'll take a look at at that in a second here and that just pops in there like that so I can change out my consumable sizes actually while I was at it here okay I'm running an SL60 and then instead of your standard open uh, tip here I run a machine style tip 
and I've got the screw on contactor here that screws over your nozzles itself and that makes the contact alright and then I got the uh, the current lead here and pops right back in there like that alright I, <clears throat> I got this piece of one inch plate in here uh, this is the drop and it's barely balancing on a couple of the points here and this is a small part we're gonna cut out a shape here and I've just got my external uh, ground on here I have two grounds on the table one goes directly to the grid and then I have a floater cable that hangs out inside the table here and I can clamp it right onto my material good ground grounding rod and all the proper electrical currents and a different power source for my computer, my plasma cutter, and the table all separated is how my machine is running as smooth as it is without any interference. Okay, there's our air. is reaching pretty close to the max on my cut and you know if I was to if I was to say a tolerance that I could hold on on big large cutting areas where like this ring right here this these circles that I cut out of this piece this was a uh, pretty true cut in fact actually I three jawed them bored out the inside did a face cut and I left the outside exactly uh, the plasma cut because it was it was that good of a, a a cut now we shrunk down a little bit and of course we're floating this piece on only a couple of these prongs on the table and we have a little bit more of side angle or, or, or a, a, a bowing or bending of the the cut itself and by the time you come around this part over here this is such a small piece for how thick it is we're generating quite a bit of heat and it's going to cut a little bit different and you will start getting that but even though it has a slight angle to it it's still a real nice clean shape to it all right that'll be a good piece to put in the window um, just for a demo on on a one inch piece and you know it is tiny I mean you know that's only three inches in it and it's one inch thick so we're cutting through one third of the entire size of the part to start with alright so there's a there's a demo of actually cutting one inch material uh, on a small scale anyway it's not like I did a big job here um, you know you can see that this finish right here on a nice large sweep is pretty cool this is actually uh, a one inch diameter circle that this this part came out of off of my table as well and now I can't pierce one inch thick and I wouldn't try to fib that story um, I pre-drill a hole where I want to start at if it's on the inside of a plate and then start from there come out and then create my circle 
this here it was easy because I was able to come in from the outside of the plate and I can do that all day long so you, you do have to give yourself a place to start but once you're coming into the edge of one inch my my combination of the thermodynamics Cutmaster 81 and the plasma table controlling the torch and I, my speed was about eight inches a minute I think I set that on and and we can get the job done all right let me uh, give you a quick look at our new holders uh, for the hypertherm torches the grips coming along on that and then we're going to get back to our regular viewing program here on the table we've got a jig set up and we're been playing with one of the gloves the gloves are the piece that fits over the torch grip itself and you take the torch grip and you'll be able to put it into the glove and put your band of zip tie here or a velcro strap was kind of a suggested uh, um, thought here which might come into play uh, three bolt holes let this glove attachment be bolted onto the pop away so after you have a pop away holder for your plasma cam and you end up changing out to another torch you can go ahead and just have the glove made for the torch to fit the pop away uh, right now we have the Duramax and we also have the T45V torches that we're working on these will be available soon anyway a quick glimpse we're going to be doing a little bit of modification to them uh, as we go along here because I got the right feel and I'm not quite comfortable on this but they are coming along and they're fitting in there properly and we'll be getting these popping in and out on plasma cams here soon all right get her done all right uh, before we we come to the uh, the end of our program here um, I just had, I had a couple things that I got in the mail this is uh, my uh, gear tooth calipers and uh, Richard uh, sent me a little package here some time ago and I haven't had a chance to really check it out uh, dear Keith you mentioned in your video making the internal spline uh, that you're gear tooth caliper was missing a locked thumb screw I thought that making one for you would be a worthwhile uh, few minutes on my 1942 South Bend 9 inch I hope your caliper is the same as mine stare at 20 uh, dash 2 uh, diametrical or uh, thread pitch or at least that of uh, the thumb screw is, is the same as in the, uh, number 356 it is the first time I've single pointed that small and fine thread so it's something new for me if by chance it isn't right let me know in correct size and I'll, I'll, I'll have a go at it it bugs me for a fine tool to be missing a screw uh, but that's probably not <laughs> I'm probably missing a couple ha huh? <laughs> best regards Richard uh, uh, I, uh, I thank you very much Richard for this and in fact I haven't even I honestly haven't even tried it but I got things out and I said well let's go because I, I cleaned off my desk on it which has been getting deep and uh, with everything going on <laughs> that's how you take care of them zip locks all right I tell you what, that is uh, that is a pretty screw. Let's see if it does fit in here. It wants the thread in there. I may actually have to ch uh, chase the hole out with the tap there too. I right? well, let's see. Let's see what the length of one of these is. Maybe I'm going all the way in already.
about an eighth of an inch shorter. Uh, my original was an eighth of an inch shorter. It goes all the way in and it holds. Nice job. I'll, uh, I'll take a couple close-up uh, shots with the new camera there and uh, so everybody gets a chance to see this up close here. There's no sense of me trying to like zoom it in on you. Um, and I can go ahead and I can sand just a little whisker off of there and it, it's a pretty darn close match. You know, a little bit of uh, Maybe just a little bit of blackening on there and we'll be all set. Thank you very much, Richard. I'll, uh, I'll be putting a little package in, sending your way uh, for gratification there. Thank you very much. Um, another thing, I just, got, uh, I just got this last week here and Tom Lipton uh, sent me a package here and a real nice uh, postcard here of the waterfront and it says Deer Island, Maine, I believe is what it is, and 119. I don't know what the significance of that is. Um, genuine photo postcard. It's cool. Um, hey Keith, I came into some nice large slitting saws recently. I wanted, uh, I watched your video come about and it looked like you could have used one. Thanks for all you do, Tom Lumpton. Um, I appreciate that very much, Tom. Uh, yeah, it seems like you get you get um, building up on some of your tooling, and sometimes you're just missing the uh, the one that'll do the job totally. And Very nice, Morris U.S. six by one sixteenth. Yeah, that would that would uh, get in there. And let me cut the thing off all in one uh, shot there. And uh, in fact, actually, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to be saturating the cardboard with a little bit of oil here, and I, I will keep these right in the uh, the cardboard for right now. And Oh, this one's one eighth. If if it's the same as the phone, well, the package is not even open. So let's uh, let's open it up. We'll see. One thing we want to make sure that it's got a little tiny bit of rust on it. You want to get something on there so it doesn't doesn't go to hell on you. You know. I shouldn't say that. Got to pay attention to it so the rust doesn't eat it up. Real nice. Same thing, Morris 1.8. Uh, a lot of times on a lot of my uh, uh, glands, uh, you need to have an eighth of an inch slot in there so that when you draw the bolt together, you got the clamping. So this is, uh, definitely will use them. I appreciate it very much. And uh, this, I think this is the second, second package or so. I, I got to get one heading your way as well. Because um, I do... Uh, I enjoy things coming in here, but I also I I, I can give a few things out myself. Um, anyhow, I uh, I appreciate that, and I didn't want to let the let the uh, packages linger because I, <laughs> I I can collect things and not open them. I'm not a I'm not a have to open guy, so um, I. I do appreciate when they do come in and I appreciate everything that everybody sends my way as well. <clears throat> I watched Adam open up a couple things there the other day and I thought it was, man, that's so, I know how it feels to have somebody send things in and 
and uh, and it is neat watching somebody else uh, uh, open up some some gifts there. Okay, that's pretty well a collage of the things that's going on here lately and what we got going on uh, probably in the next week or so as far as starting on with the uh, the big shaft and uh, sleeves there for uh, Robert R. Um, the other things we were able to handle and get, those are the kind of things that come in the door and kind of interrupt the regular path of things. Uh, this is our next project and our next video series. I'm calling it Wing It. Those of you following me on Facebook already know and have seen some of the progress and some of the uh, sneak peeks of actually uh, the, the tracer attachment I cover in depth on this episode, um, this series. And uh, it's going to be multiple series and I'm going to be plugging it along. They're not all going to be done at one time and then launch them. So uh, this, this project is going to go on for a little bit and I'm getting back to it tonight so I, I actually have been working a little bit late night uh, just keeping up with the load that I actually have uh, going on right now alright until uh, the next video get it done Uh, as we get our shit together here. <laughs> uh.